Good morning, everyone. My name is Danielle Cave, and I'm from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, a defence, national security and critical tech think tank based in one of the world's uh, most underrated cities of Canberra. Uh, if you haven't been there, do put Canberra on your must-visit list, not right at the top, maybe second tier, third tier, fourth tier uh, visits. Uh, and I'm being <laughs> a few laughs, thank you. Being a bit unfair there, I'm actually a CAM ambassador. It's a great place, uh, full of foreign policy and national security wonks. And Australia is broadly uh, packed full of well travelled and global, globally curious people who are often deeply invested uh, in the Indo Pacific. And you'll see a lot of Australians milling around uh, the Racina dialogue from government, business, universities, and think tanks. My think tank here is ASPE, a delegation of six. I think we're larger than some of the smaller European delegations, and so we're here in force, uh, which is lovely. Uh, now, you guys have all made it uh, to the almost, I think, last day of the Racina Dialogue, put on by the incredibly impressive ORF team. I do not know how they do it. It's like a marathon, but you're sprinting the entire time, and I can't keep up. Uh, but ORF do it so well, and I think the Indo-Pacific in particular is so lucky to have uh, a think tank like ORF, and India is particularly fortunate in that respect. Um, our esteemed panel here today, to my right, is here to talk about a range of things, and we're going to try to cover as much as we can. We've just had five minutes shaved off, so it's going to be tight. Uh, we're going to try to talk about critical technologies, the information environment, and essentially what democracies can do, aren't doing, should be doing, to set themselves up for a future, which in reality, the future is already here, in which critical technologies and information are reshaping the strategic environment, our public spheres, our societies, uh, our economies, and will shape even further our future. Um, so I'm hoping we'll get to some of these some of these big discussions. It is a huge topic. I'm not going to read through everyone's bios. We don't have time. You have them in your booklets. You can you can grab them via your uh, QR codes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take two rounds of questions to our panelists. They will get two questions in those two rounds. They can pick and choose what they want. They overlap. We'll then go, I believe, to the young fellows for a round of questions. If we have time, noting we just lost five minutes, I'd love to come to the audience and take three at a time, and then we'll flick back to our panelists. So I'm going to run it a bit tightly. I apologize for that, uh, but I think it's needed. Uh, on our panel here, we have India's Minister of State for Skill Development and Entrepreneurship, Electronics and Information Technology. So a very big and mixed portfolio there. Uh, Rashiv Chandra Shekhar. So thank you for joining us. Uh, we have Frank Muller Rosentritt, Member of Parliament for Germany. And I don't know if everyone's noticed, but Germany seems to have quite a big delegation here. So I feel like there's a really nice soft power. There's some sort of German soft power momentum going on here at Racina. Um, Leslie Miller is there next to the Minister, Vice President, Government Affairs and Public Policy for YouTube. So thank you for joining us, Leslie. Uh, Chris Lovejoy, uh, right here. Um, Global Practice Leader for Security and Resilience, um, Kindrel. Uh, and then finally, we have Chief Cybersecurity Strategist Mihoko Matsubaru from NTT Corporation Japan, a huge uh, company uh, in Japan. So let's kick off. And what I'm going to do, Minister, is I'll start with you and then we'll waterfall down with this round and then we might go back like that and we'll see how that travels. Um, and you've got the sort of home, home court advantage here. Um, so the two questions I'm going to put, put to you and you pick and choose what you'd like to do here. What do countries need to do in order to excel in the area of critical technology competition? What can they do differently and how can they better cooperate to leverage each other's strengths? So that's option one. Option two, because this is choose your own adventure, how can democracies and minilateral groupings, whether that be the Democracies 11, I guess formerly the D10, uh, or the Quad or others, uh, do to help provide pathways for a tech secure open societies of the future? So two overlapping questions there for you, Minister. I'll answer for, and you can choose uh, whichever question that answer is aligned to. Uh, so thank you for uh, uh, giving me the, uh, the, the lead on this or the, the first question. Uh, so, so the way we look at it in India is, uh, is uh, very commonsensical. I mean, I don't want to pretend that uh, there is some great, deep uh, nuclear science-like thinking behind this. Uh, and the fact is this, that post-COVID, it is clear that the digital supply chains, the value chains, the innovation ecosystem, if you want to call it that, uh, the, the critical technologies ecosystem is undergoing a deep 
structural change. Uh, a few years ago, we allowed, uh, in a sense, a concentration of these technologies and these products and these supply chains around certain economies. We sort of blindly believed in the global economic system or the global system of trade. And we have realized post-COVID that those sort of uh, hopes or those uh, beliefs were uh, not terribly sound. So I think the first is that there is this reordering of the, if you want to call it the semiconductor world order, the electronics world order, and the innovation world order that is underway. The second is <clears throat> no country is going to be able to do this alone. Uh, so if anybody is deluding themselves and saying, we will be the king of the hill in semiconductors and electronics and innovation. Uh, it is precisely that is delusion. So I think what we are proposing uh, in India, and we've, uh, we've been steadily arguing for this for some years now, is that amongst like-minded countries and like-minded nations, there ought to be more of a cooperative framework. Regardless of whether you look at, uh, through that cooperative framework, that prism, you look at future tech, we look at critical tech, of regulating the internet, the rules and do go no go areas. So I think there is need for uh, post COVID and this new world uh, that we live in a much more institutional framework in how we approach these technologies and the future of tech in in particular. So that is what we are doing. Uh, that is what we believe in, and we are, uh, like I said, uh, looking at this reordered new world order in semiconductors, electronics, and critical technologies. Uh, in terms of partnerships with like-minded nations. Fantastic. Leslie, let's, let's jump to you. Sure. Uh, first, thank you very much for uh, hosting me and YouTube and inviting me to this panel. Um, you said something that I want to build off of um, that I really agree with, which is um, cooperative frameworks. And for a company like YouTube that is obviously global in scale, um, but has a presence in most countries around the globe. The idea of cooperative frameworks, multi-stakeholder processes, is something that we are um, really invested in. And I actually think during COVID, um, uh, information is generally free-flowing through most of the world at this point. And when there are uh, enormous events that happen societally, such as COVID, or the war in Ukraine and things of that nature, companies like YouTube have a responsibility. And the responsibility is around making sure that we are not creating risk for real world harm, that we're partnering with authorities to make sure that we're raising up appropriate and authoritative information, and that we're increasingly doing it in a more nuanced and local way in order to respect local cultures, uh, local sensitivities and things of that nature. But I will say we are at our strongest when we're doing it truly in the multi-stakeholder way. So working with governments and civil society where there is a shared understanding for the rule of law, um, for trying to strike the balance regarding where there can be the value of free expression, but not at the expense of causing harm at a local level. And that is something um, that even though the internet and tech companies have now been around for at least a quarter of a century, this is all real, really relatively new in continuing to figure this out. And I certainly agree with you that it's sort of these areas have been modified and accelerated post-COVID. And worth noting that none of this is, is easy either. Frank, let's jump to you in the middle here. Yes, yeah, so you... I also answer, and you can pick uh, what question I answer. Um, and at first, I have to say also for Germany um, that we are all in the Western world in a systemic uh, conflict competition with China. And um, we must accept it is as such, and uh, we have to see how vulnerable Germany is right now and was in the past. Um, and we see that we, I think, didn't care about m that much we should care about uh, democracies in the world. So if you see Angela Merkel traveled, I think, 13 times to China and three times to India. Uh, we care about a lot of Russia, and now we see how dependent we are. Look at our gas, for example. 
So our fuel from Russia. So and we see we are so vulnerable, and we want to change it. And that we have such a big dedication to this Rasina dialogue is also a sign that we want to care much more in this region because we want to be uh, yes we, we want to be a partner of democracy. And this is uh, the, the second one that I want to mention uh, that freedom and democracy are hard earned, and with the rise of populism and anti democratic forces, too often too easily lost. And uh, that's why we must uh, make very, every effort to safeguard the core shared values we hold dear and strengthen the resilience of our democracies together. To strengthen our democracies clearly lies in cooperation. This is, I think, the most important, the most important sign what also should get out from this uh, conference this is co cooperation. And I think uh, when it comes how we can make it, um, I think additionally to the existing groups like the Quad, uh, we need to campaign for a global alliance of democracies. Um, that uh, including a concrete organizational framework, it should be founded by states as a club that makes it a central task to promote the rule of law and democracy, like you mentioned, uh, worldwide, um, to live these values. And then we can see, we can, we can uh, talk with like-minded partners how we uh, face, how we handle it with, uh, with other partners, because sometimes Germany were blind, because our neighbors are Czech Republic, Poland, France, the Netherlands, and your neighbors are Russia and North Korea. Israel neighbors are much more crazier. So, and we, I think, uh, 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 and look at, uh, look at uh, the neighbors of tai Taiwan, for example. And so we have to be much more engaged in these countries because we can learn from these countries because every solution we, we searching in Germany they have already a solution. And mm. so we have to be there and work together in the uh, a new alliance of demo democracies. So you're thinking sort of D11 plus, 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 plus. Yes. In a way. Uh, yes. Okay. All of right. Course. Very ambitious. Um, Mahoko, let's go to you. Sure. So to be competitive in critical technology, countries need to be transparent, open, and market driven. Okay. But I'm sure that everybody in this room have heard all of this many, many times over the last few years. So my question to you is, what are we missing in this crazy world? I, I would say that it's our energy friendliness. Because we are now living the energy crisis in an unprecedented level. And also we face a climate change and what we need to do be competitive, what kind of technology. So facing that the war in Ukraine and also that the COVID, I would say that telecommunications or communications. Why? Because communications is a key to, to communicate with you and everything is needed to be communicated for daily lives, business operations, and safety of the lives. And fortunately, we already have a good uh, case study here and great examples driven by like-minded countries and like-minded companies. Uh, so to create cutting-edge end-to-end uh, uh, ICT infrastructure for 5G and beyond, and it's called uh, Innovative Optical and Wireless Network. And it was established uh, three years ago. And more than 90 companies uh, belong to this ION Global Forum from manufacturers, finance, food, chemical, ICT, semiconductors, and also telecommunication companies from Japan, my country, uh, also South Korea, Taiwan, Europe, and also the United States. Why? Because to create a just a competitive technology is a just a first step. You also have to create a good ecosystem to, to make sure to serve your customers and serve the regions and to understand the sensitivity of different cultures. 
So I'm so encouraged to see that so many countries and companies across the regions and across the sectors are already committed to make sure to everybody can access to the cutting edge uh, communication technologies. And not only that, this is really mindful about energy friendliness. And this uh, ION Global Forum is aiming to uh, decrease power consumption by 100 times. And I, I'm so, uh, and even though you know, we are hearing uh, different voices and some disconsent uh, over the last uh, two and a half days, but I'm so glad and I'm so grateful that the uh, um, ORIF are uh, putting together this raising uh, uh, dialogues to, to bridge uh, different voices. And also to, to, that India is leading the, the, the bridge, uh, the, 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 the democracies on the global south so that make, we, we can make sure to create a good teams to, to have a, the good technologies for, to serve everybody. Thank you for that. That was interesting, putting forward that framework as an option there. Chris, let's go to you. Okay, and I will, I will be as brief as I can. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there's an old saying that the uh, most effective democracies thrive on competition, but excel at cooperation. And I think that's why we're here. We're here to cooperate. And I, I, I don't think one can abstract technology, um, you know, from this sort of need uh, to, as the foundation uh, for this cooperation. I'm going to answer this question in a little bit of a different way which is as a member of private industry representing the cybersecurity community, what do I see as the potential um, blockages to that cooperation? I think there is a reality here that we don't often talk about, and that's the, how populism has um, informed our regulatory authorities and the approaches to the implementation of data localization, data sovereignty, digital sovereignty rules. We have to be very, very circumspect around the implementation of these requirements. I w understand the need to protect our citizens' rights of privacy. I understand and, and believe me, uh, we, we all share the, the importance of protecting our national security. However, the implementation of silos of control around technology and data that is resident in, in your nation state has a dampening effect on your ability to, com to compete, your ability to leverage technology outside, and is going to ultimately impact your, your private industry's ability to import technology because those organizations, infrastructure, countries with, with whom you want to cooperate are going to be instituting their own requirements that are themselves very siloed. So again, in this era of cooperation, and I'm thrilled to see so many like-minded people here talking about shared values and priorities, we have to recognize that we have to not just say it, we have to do it. We have to collaborate on standards that are internationally framed and can be adopted by all such that cooperation is possible. Yeah. Fantastic. The, the standards conversation, uh, even in the sidelines the last few days, has just been coming up again and again and again. Look, we're going to flick to information now, and I was going to go backwards, but actually I'd like to go back to you, Minister, and we'll come back. Let's keep. Let's try to keep this quite tight so we can go to the young fellows for questions. Uh, if they don't have questions, we'll open up to the audience. So I want to now move to our information sphere. How do we protect it? So how can democracies better defend elections and prevent the weaponization of their public sphere? How can the manipulation of technology platforms by bad actors, including authoritarian states, who don't allow countries to engage in their cyberspace, but can engage very deeply, both overtly and in covert ways in our cyberspace. I think that's a really important point. Um, be counted and prevented. So let's start with you, Minister. So uh, just as I said, uh, Daniel, in the first question, and I pointed to this trend uh, that we need to have like-minded countries working together in shaping the future of tech. And uh, 
I say on the other side, the other trend that is emerging is that the relationship between governments and tech and governments and the internet also are undergoing a tectonic change. For many years, innovation was left unregulated because it was innovation. So you suddenly found after a decade of uh, being left alone, we suddenly have to deal with these so-called problems of big tech. And so therefore, there is clearly a correction in the way how governments are responding to these platforms, what the platforms mean in terms of good, but also the user harm, and all of those other uh, issues that are associated with the platforms. As far as India is concerned, we have squarely defined three boundary conditions uh, around which we believe everybody should uh, operate on the Indian internet and therefore we hope with global cooperation those principles will find wider play uh, amongst many nations, which is that the internet should be open. It should certainly not be like, be like the Chinese internet. The internet should be a safe and trusted space. Very important for India because we have 800 million Indians using the internet and by 25, 26, we'll have a 1.2 billion Indians. And these are old, young, women, men, uh, digitally very literate, digitally illiterate. So the internet being a safe and trusted space is an article of faith. It is a duty for the government to deliver to our citizens. And the third is this accountability principle, that regardless of whether you're a big tech headquartered in ABCD land or nation, if you do business in India, you have to, pres you have to be accountable. So we have prescribed, for example, or even on the areas that you refer to, that are challenging to democracy, and you know, India is the largest democracy in the world, and it's obviously even more critical issue for us. There are certain casted obligations of those platforms that operate in India. And we prescribe them uh, through a formulation called the IT rules, and we, <coughs> we've got nine categories of content and or information that are absolutely no-go areas for platforms, then there is a casted obligation on them that if they want to enjoy the immunity and safe harbor under our laws from prosecution and continue to pretend that they are not publishers, they have to do these one to nine content issues being dealt with. And those deal with CSAM on one end, misinformation on the other end of the spectrum, but there's a whole series of other things. And of course, there's this predictable uh, conversation about whether does it infringe on freedom of speech, does it infringe on privacy, all of that. But our contention is that the fundamental rights of Indian citizens we will protect, but at the same time we have a duty to maintain that the internet is a safe and trusted space for all Indians. Okay. And I, look, I think that predictable conversation is an important one, right? We need to keep debating these issues. I mean, you can see lots of different countries trying to navigate this space. Yep. No one is doing it, I think, perfectly. Uh, good, good time for you to come in here, Leslie. Look, you, you, you're a very senior member of YouTube, one of the world's, if not the world's biggest video streaming platform. How does this look from your perspective? Uh, yeah, again, I, uh, I want to build off a little bit of what the minister shared um, in terms of um, operating a global platform. Uh, we certainly welcome um, and encourage that there be built up a consensus of a framework in which uh, many governments and societies can come together and have a shared framework of what digital regulation um, and striking that balance regarding free expression um, and harm standards. Um, and to the extent that there can be, be this consensus, it would certainly be helpful for platforms like ours. Um, for YouTube, when we think about topics such as misinformation and disinformation, um, it is, much more challenging and nuanced than, for example, you reference CSAM, um, which is, uh, apologies in advance, but it's child sexual abuse material. Um, historically, for companies, there were types of material that are rather obvious in nature, very visual, and there's a universal understanding that they shouldn't be allowed and promulgated on the internet. And so we've long had policies in place as a company, but also um, comply with local laws everywhere we operate in areas like this. But misinformation and disinformation is not as obvious. Uh, and so when we've thought about misinformation, we began to think about it in terms of, if you just try and address it just as one term, it's nearly impossible 
So we've thought about it in terms of verticals, election related misinformation. So we have policies in place whereby we will not allow content that um, provides misinformation around candidate eligibility, the date in which to vote, where to vote, the outcome of the vote, things of that nature. So we thought about it as a vertical and put policies in place that exist globally. We've, we've also done this in the area of medical misinformation. So COVID, again, is a very clear example of this. And we launched several policies over the course of the pandemic to make sure that we were not participating in the trafficking of misinformation on this topic. But I will say COVID, over the course of the pandemic, there was very healthy debates on the origins of the virus, the efficacy of masks, uh, the type of um, medicine uh, to address if you've received COVID. So these things are, can be not incredibly clear cut, even when there is universal scientific consensus. So making sure that we are trying to address the harm while still allowing for a level of debate is how we've approached misinfo in a couple of those categories. Disinformation, we think about slightly differently. So we have policies in place regarding deceptive practices. So if there is material that is being created for the sole purpose of deceiving people um, and we can identify it, it will violate our policies. But across Google, we long ago created an organization, a team of people called the Threat Analysis Group. And the Threat Analysis Group looks much more at the means um, and ways in which disinformation is uh, the origins of it and the traffic of it. And this threat analysis group is regularly uh, surveying hundreds of organizations around the globe who exist to create information to sow discord in societies. And when we spot the evolutions of those organizations, we will take action across the company. We will close, we will close down their accounts and remove their channels on YouTube. But I will say that these efforts they're, they're sort of never ending because every time we can assess or governments can identify and assess uh, these vehicles for disinformation and pushing propaganda, many more entities pop up. So this is something that I'm sure other colleagues here on the panel, they can speak to that this area of security is, um, is something that we have to continue to, to put significant resources behind and again, work with governments uh, on the evolution of those narratives and the intent. Yeah, I think, look, at ASPE, we track um, a huge number of state-backed disinfo and info campaigns in the Indo-Pacific, and I can tell you it is proliferating. Companies are not on top of it. Governments are not on top of it. I think it's getting to a space uh, where we, we think the Indo-Pacific needs a sort of hybrid threat centre. It's, mm -hmm. it's at the point where everyone is struggling in lots of different ways, and they're only seeing little pieces of it. So it's an interesting challenge. Look, we've got um, 17 minutes left. There's this giant screen that counts down the seconds, uh, and it puts a lot of pressure on you. So what I might do for the three of you, if anyone is desperate to bite into this topic, let's do it. Uh, if not, and, and, you, and you're very welcome to, I'd like to go to the audience for questions. Frank, do you want to bite into this topic very briefly? Only very briefly, yes. Yep. Um, I think research, as you said, research is a, is a very, very important thing. And yeah. we have in Europe, the, yeah. the, the, the uh, Horizon Europe, it's a very big uh, research project. And I think we should do, we should, and we should to enlarge it to maybe Horizon D11 or uh, that we have Horizon Europe plus plus, um, then we are faced to, especially in Germany, we are, we, are, we are faced to fake news everywhere. And the war in the Ukraine, the war in the Ukraine, the attack in the, from Russia to Ukraine was prepared by fake news for many years. So a lot of people in Germany believe the Russian narrative because they prepared it for many years. And so fake news, as uh, the biggest, biggest threat for democracy. And freedom is the most important thing we have in the world. And we should, um, be, we should enable or encourage our young people uh, to see fake news. And it is, I have three daughters, and it's, very, it's not that easy f uh, to show uh, how, uh, how you um, can say it's fake news or not. And then you can learn from Japan or from Taiwan how they deal with fake news. And I think this is the most important thing for national corporations um, that we find, that we find um, 
common system, how we deal with fake news. And, and I think research, uh, common research with all together, like Horizon, Europe, Horizon D11 would be very, very, would be very important. Yeah, that there's certainly an education piece here exactly, that's yeah. missing, isn't there? Yes. Um, do either of you want to bite into this or else we'll really quickly, if that's okay, and then we'll go to audience questions. If you can always come back to this as well. Sure. Um, so yesterday, uh, former Defence Secretary Jim Marius uh, emphasised the importance of uh, education, especially for young generations. And I would say that this information, the misinformation, not only the problem for democracies, it's for everybody. And I, I think we can learn from uh, Finland because Finland updated its educational program back in 2013 to include a media literacy program. And they started to provide how to compare different sources to spot disinformation or misinformation. And also that they teach how to compare different sites. So, so like how easy to manipulate uh, video clips or how easy to Photoshop and that way, they can learn the, 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 the difficulties and also the, 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 the importance of uh, the, the media literacy programs. And um, thank you. Thank you. So, I, you know, I think just to be clear, you know, technology, it embodies the values and the priorities of the people who build it, who test it, who inform it, and who post in it. And um, I think we have to recognize that um, it, as such, it is fallible. Um, and so what you're hearing from the panel here is that there's really, there is a framework that we're all recommending that be adopted. I mean, first and foremost, policies need to be implemented to guide the use of this technology. Um, we need to have human review and appeal processes. Um, third, we need to have literacy uh, programs in place to help um, you know, the individuals understand what it is that they're reading and understand the trustworthiness of the data. And then finally, research imperatives. Understand how people are influenced and understand how technology helps influence them. That's just the that was sum a, up. That was an excellent way to sum up, sum up that question. So, Racina Fellows, are there questions at the back there? Let's take two or three, and then we'll go to the broader audience for two, and then it's, it's, you guys have a hard job of trying to pick through all of those. Uh, so we might, we'll start with the Racina Fellows. Hi. Uh, Minister Chandrasekhar, I wonder if you could comment a little bit on the importance of digital democracy, particularly in the context of some of the internet shutdowns in India and some of the like TikTok ban and that sort of thing. Great question, and then we'll take another one. Thank you so much. I wanted to come back to something that you all were talking about earlier about the need for like-minded democracies to work together and to form frameworks. Um, and I'm specifically interested to hear your thoughts on surveillance technologies, uh, which would seem like a natural place to start to try to define what democratic use versus authoritarian use looks like. Um, so I'm curious to hear from uh, anyone who wants to take this. Uh, what a framework, what it would take to create a framework of that nature, and if those conversations are ongoing, what are some of the barriers that we've seen up to this point? Thank you. Okay, that's a big question. Do we have a third question from a Racina Fellow? If not, we'll jump to the two gentlemen and the woman here. Okay, L let's jump to you two, and then we'll finish over here with you. Well, thank you. My name is Ricardo. I'm a member of Parliament in Portugal and the president of, the, of UNITE, the Parliamentarians Network for Global Health. Uh, currently present in 95 countries, and I want to address the digital divide. We, we know, particularly uh, looking at sub-Saharan Africa, that only 83% of the population have access to a phone. Of those, only 13% have access to a smartphone. And of those, uh, around only half have had, uh, ever had access to the internet. And from a health perspective, the further away someone lives from a health clinic, lesser is the probability of actually having access to a smartphone and access to the internet. So with the rise of digital as being a fundamental part of all of our strategies at a global scale, is there a risk that we are actually deepening the equity divide? How can we, in a way, address this digital divide to make sure that we leave no one behind under the SDG format? And the second part of that question is, as we do expand access to the internet in a very accelerated manner, knowing the time that education and literacy takes to, to, to fulfill its fruits, 
what can we do to address the misinformation that will lead to? Thank you. Thank you. And let's stick with you. Yes, my name is Matthew Asada. I'm an AFGG alum and a visiting fellow at the University of Southern California. Uh, my question was prompted by something that the representative from YouTube had mentioned about striking down harmful conflict, whether it's sexual predators, whether it's fake news. Uh, at this panel discussion here on Democracies 11, I was wondering if we need to uh, look at something that is more kind of like verified by Twitter or like uh, verified that you're a human, like recaptcha. Is there something that needs to be democracy verified that would associate with a citizen, with a political party, uh, with a movement, so that rather than striking fake content, we're going to a, a proactive, positive confirmation of something that is democracy verified. So it could also be a uh, something that would apply to um, countries and governments as well. Food for thought. Okay, okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Yukti Pawar. I'm a final year student of MA in di uh, Diplomacy, Law and Business from OP Jindal University and also the Center Coordinator for Center for Security Studies, GSIA. So my question was regarding the gap we have between the development of technology and the development of laws and infrastructure we have to be able to secure the nation and the citizens. So uh, we have laws right now, but is it enough to be able to bridge that gap and protect the critical information and technology the countries have for their own security and for the security of the citizens? And also alongside that, uh, the gap between the way uh, countries are developing their technologies, like the differences between region and countries. So as a, at the world stage, how do we bridge that gap? And is it, a, is it too late to start working towards that now? I just wanted to ask that. Thank you. Thank you. Gosh, there's a lot there to chew on. Um, what we'll do is, Minister, because you had one specific question, I'm going to give you uh, two and a half minutes. Everyone else uh, gets a minute less than that. So just, so, just my first question, yes? Oh, you can answer any of those. But okay. yes, the first one was digital democracy and internet shutdowns. Just as a reminder. And I do, and I do as much as I can in two minutes. Great. Two, okay. two and a half. Good. Two and a half. Yeah, goes. So the digital democracy question, I just want to point out, there is no difference uh, between democracy and digital democracy. The values that we practice, the fundamental rights of our citizens are exactly what we uh, transpose and expect to be, uh, to be implemented and available on the cyberspace. On the issue of internet shutdowns, and I think there is this narrative that's been put out there deliberately because the numbers seem large. But as a percentage of the total number of internet users in India and the diversity and the enormity of the content ecosystem, the percentage is among the smallest in the world. And any internet shutdown or indeed content takedown is lawfully prescribed and lawfully ordered by the government uh, in these exceptional circumstances under the law. So I just wanted to say that. On, there was a question about uh, digital divide. And I certainly want to take that up in the Indian context. In the Indian context, the goal that our Prime Minister set out for technology was that it transforms people's lives. And actually, technology is here bridging the divide, is bringing the furthest citizen into the governance, uh, the reach of the governance. So in, in the Indian context, technology actually is reversing decades of trends of many, many citizens sitting outside uh, governance and uh, government and is, uh, is, is doing exactly the opposite. Uh, verification, somebody mentioned about democracy. The problem with that is a large part of the users on social media and the internet still like to be anonymous. So we have to decide whether it's anonymity that you want for privacy or you want verifi verifiability to ensure that misinformation cannot be, uh, uh, not be detected or not be pursued. So this is an interesting policy dichotomy that most governments face, that we want to give uh, the anonymity right to users because they, they want their privacy, but at the same time we want to pursue criminality and user harm. The last point about gaps between laws and tech, it's, it's absolutely clear uh, if you just go back and look at uh, the last 10 years, laws have lagged innovation, laws have lagged the uh, progress and growth of these big platforms. And uh, governments all around the world, I believe, are trying to catch up uh, with, that, uh, with that lag over the last 10 years. And we're trying to catch up. Certainly in India, we're trying to catch up very fast. 
that was, you did an excellent job there to cover most of those questions. Uh, Leslie, over to you. The only other question that, that strikes was the one on um, like-minded democracy, surveillance tech and authoritarian. Uh, is there a framework for that? Um, so over to you on any of those questions. Um, okay. Uh, I'm just was looking. I, I wanted to come back on a couple of the things really quick, um, which is the idea of digital literacy. And you touched on this. I think it's received a fair amount of international press, which is what uh, Finland has done in terms of updating its curriculum, uh, not just for youth, but for adults um, in uh, incorporating digital literacy uh, into everyday um, curriculum, which uh, for YouTube and other companies, we realize that this, is a, that this is something we need to be a contributor to as well. And so in addition to handling misinfo and figuring out what content shouldn't stay up, um, but also helping be a part of the solution of identifying when there is misinformation, things of that nature. So we roll out campaigns, we do it at a global scale. We have one going now that's called Hit Pause. And the sole purpose of this is to encourage people to pause before they click on material to make sure that they are better understanding um, the material that they're going to be seeing. It, we rolled this out at, towards the end of last year. There's been over, um, I think, just about 2,000 or 2 billion, view, 2 billion views of this. Um, and it's across many different countries, including here um, in India. On the, on the having a government um, verified approach, uh, that idea is intriguing. Um, would it work, do you think? A, think a democracy that, verified approach to I think content it would be, management? I, I think at the end it would be very challenging. Um, it, the minister mentioned something about anonymity, and I do think in some places there's value in people being able to um, find a community online um, uh, with some level of anonymity, but not at the expense of creating harm for others. Uh, so I agree with you on that. But I think verifying information can be born in many ways. It can be born in terms of when there's a breaking news, something that's happening that's breaking news, companies like ours are going to make sure that we're ranking authoritative sources. And authoritative sources tend to be more traditional news or medical experts or things of that nature. Um, we also make sure that you can see that, it's, that, the, that the content is coming from somebody who's been verified um, and things of that nature. Whereas just think about the amount of content that is created any second or any minute across the globe. It, I just can't imagine technologically an ability for a government sponsored verification of that information at the pace in which it would need to happen. But I like the concept of it because we need to keep trying to find ways to do something like that, but I'm not sure that may be the, the exact right answer to it. It's an interesting idea. Um, all right, everybody, we've got 50 <laughs> seconds per Sorry. person left. No, 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 no problem. It's, it's, a, it's an incredibly tight timeline. 50 seconds each, uh, and then we've got to go. You can see the time there. Frank, over to you. What do you want to answer the most out of all those questions? Yeah. Um, very, very briefly. Maybe we, we I can have two, two things. One is uh, we have already a framework in the European Union. It's a Digital Service Act and the Digital Market Act. And uh, so we agree together um, on such norms across all, like, across nation jurisdiction in Europe. So and I think this is, uh, we can uh, also give this information to the D11 and have the same framework for all these countries be, uh, to share this, the same things. And um, awareness in school, media competence, of course. And the th uh, third thing, <laughs> I think, while, cover while the coverage of the uh, Chinese spy balloon occupied media for weeks, uh, all over the world, um, other forms of um, fake news influence or Chinese influence uh, were not that much covered. And I think it's more important to, uh, that, that people can uh, read about uh, TikTok, how, how dangerous is it, how it works. And, so, and, I, th and I think uh, also media have a very, very, um, uh, have a very strong um, uh, task um, to... Um, to occupy more in how we can how we can um, how we can identify fake news in other forms. Yep. Thank you. Mahoko, very brief response, please. So the, the, the to address the digital divide between the rural areas and the city areas. Um, 
So as a Japanese, I'm proud to see that the Japanese uh, JICA, the government, and also Japanese companies have been helping to provide uh, communications, uh, the equipment um, to, 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 to bridge the digital divide. But we need, we need to add more values because to, to provide communications structure means that to change the way of living. So you, you also have to provide like a roads and transportation, transportation so that you can make sure to provide supplies and maintenance service in a smooth manner and also cybersecurity too. Perfectly brief. Okay, finally. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, one thing I'd like to do is, is point out a program that um, India is running. It's uh, called Cyber Rock Shack as a way of describing, you know, how important grassroots programs to teach cyber liter literacy are. So, uh, you know, in a week from uh, the Women's uh, Equality Day, I um, wanted to just point out that this program is all about training young women in rural areas to be cyber ambassadors for their communities by going through a cyber, uh, an abbreviated cybersecurity curriculum. You know, again, misinformation, disinformation, it's the flame. Ignorance, it's the fuel. And in order for us to really address this issue, we have to, we have to address it at the root. And I think India is doing a great job of, uh, of, a dev of dealing with the issue as well as creating some women's equity. That was an excellent way to end, Chris. Let's thank our panelists. <laughs> <laughs>